Sorry, I'll just briefly introduce you. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Aura. I work at the Mental Health Foundation Australia, and I'm your host for today's webinar. I begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people as the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work and pay my respects to them, their culture, and their elders past, present, and emerging. On behalf of the Mental Health Foundation Australia and the CEO, Mr. Vasan Serena Vasan, I would like to welcome and thank each one of you for joining today's Be Well educational webinar on autism and mental health. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Professor Amanda Richdale. Amanda Rich. Professor Richdale is a researcher at the Olga Tennyson Autism Research Center, La Trobe University. She is also an educational and developmental psychologist. She has worked in the autism field for over 30 years, including early intervention and assessment and diagnosis, but her primary research interest is autism and co-occurring conditions, particularly sleep difficulties and their interrelationships with mental health. Amanda led the Autism CRC's longitudinal study of Australian school leavers with autism, which examined social, emotional, and mental and physical health factors in autistic young people aged 15 to 25 years over two years. Currently, her research, her research interests focus on factors underlying sleep and mental health difficulties in autism, and working with colleagues to investigate ACT as an intervention approach. Also joining us today is our guest, Fiona Lynette Vu, who will be coordinating the Q&A portion for today's webinar and co-answering some of our audience's questions. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming adjunct Professor Amanda Richdale for her presentation. Thank you, Aura. Um, I'll now share my screen. Let's get that on to right. We're on slideshow. Okay. So today we're going to talk about um, autism, mental health, and sleep. And I could we could talk about this for a very long time. And also, I'm just recovering from a cold, so please excuse me if I have to turn off the sound at some stage to sneeze or something like that. So what I hope to do is look sort of generally at mental health conditions, partic more particularly at anxiety and depression, a, a mention of suicide, to look at sleep problems and to give an overview about what we know about intervention. So if we have a look at um, this particular slide, we can see that um, it covers comorbid psychiatric or co-occurring psychiatric conditions in autistic adults. The Crone study, which is the first pair of columns, it's from a, a Northern Californian health fund, which examined med, uh, mental and physical health conditions in autistic and non-autistic people. Uh, about two thirds of the sample was aged 18 to 29 years. And as you can see, there were one and a half thousand autistic and 15,000 non-autistic uh, people reported in this study. And autistic people overall had more, um, more physical and mental health problems than the non-autistic people. But in particular, looking at a range of common mental health conditions, you can see that across all mental health conditions, there is a huge increase in the um, prevalence compared with the non-autistic uh, group, including suicide attempts. The second study is somewhat different. It's 859 adults who were referred for a potential diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And then the study looked at um, psychiatric uh, diagnoses uh, that might have differed in those that ended up with a diagnosis of uh, autism spectrum disorder and those that didn't. So about 55% ended up with a diagnosis and 47% did not. And the two, um, the, the, the two conditions that this uh, study found differentiated those who went on to get an, an autism diagnosis were an anxiety disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder. And you can see rates, again, rates of other um, disorders were quite high in both groups. And you uh, do find that um, 
adults are being more often diagnosed with autism these days and they're being picked up quite often when they're referred for other mental health conditions. This study looked at adults over 40 years of age. It was um, conducted in, in uh, Wisconsin and they looked at adults with any psychiatric condition uh, with and without intellectual disability and found that similar numbers um, had, I'm just going to reduce this, I'm finding this a little bit distracting, that's better. They found that any psychiatric condition was present in about two thirds of those who had autism and intellectual disability and about 76% of those in, with autism, but they found that this was not significant. These adults were receiving Medicaid services in Wisconsin and they were included in the study if they had at least two um, claims on, on two different occasions for an ICD-9 uh, psychiatric condition. The average age of the sample was 52 years and they varied from 40 to 88 years. Three quarters of them, uh, sorry, two thirds of them were male. Um, and as you'll see, I've highlighted anxiety disorder and depression, and they were the two disorders that they reported in the discussion uh, significantly differentiated uh, those who had uh, autism without intellectual disability and those who had autism with intellectual disability. Um, another thing to remember when working with autistic people who may have um, intellectual disability is that undiagnosed mental health conditions may be associated with challenging behaviours that are so often reported in those with an intellectual disability. It can be much more difficult to determine whether or not autistic people with an intellectual disability do have a co-occurring um, mental health condition. This is from the Autism CRC study that I led, looking at mental health in Australian young people. So this is looking at the autistic and non-autistic people who uh, reported a diagnosis of depression, a diagnosis of anxiety or a diagnosis of ADHD. And with respect to the sleep issues, it was the percentage, uh, no one reported a, a diagnosed sleep problem in this study, but we looked at the percentage who reported um, exceeding the clinical uh, threshold of the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. And you can see that depression, anxiety and ADHD uh, are much more prevalent in the autistic young people in terms of diagnosis, but they're equally reporting poor sleep, which we do find is a problem in adolescents, regardless of whether or not um, they are autistic. Interestingly, in this study, uh, these young people also reported on their uh, depressive and anxiety anxiety symptoms using standardized questionnaires, including the HADS. And we found that in terms of reporting their symptom symptomatology, there was no difference between the autistic and the non-autistic young people, suggesting that adolescence is a, is a difficult time, regardless of whether you've got autism or not. And so now if we have a look at anxiety, there's been a number of meta-analyses looking at anxiety in autistic people. And this is one of the more recent ones by Lay and colleagues who looked at a range of mental um, health conditions. So anxiety affects the, abil the ability of the individual to function well in everyday life and everyday situations and can impact on school attendance and quality of life. It can be related in autism and um, to biological uh, factors intrinsic to autism and to external factors which autistic uh, people experience more than non-autistic people such as um, bullying uh, stressors and also in children um, perhaps to parent parental um, mental health. So this was looking at the lay study um, looked at any DSM uh, or ICD diagnosis between the beginning of February 1993 um, and I think it was uh, February 2019. So basically covering DSM-4, DSM-5 and ICD-10 and 11. And they found that across the lifespan from childhood to adolescence, 20% um, of their sample had a DSM or ICD uh, diagnosis current diagnosis of anxiety. A study in 2011 by 
Stenzel and colleagues looked at autistic children aged two to 18 years, and they were looking at um, DSM-4 anxiety disorders. And they found uh, that 40% of their sample had a DSM-5 anxiety, uh, sorry, DSM-4 anxiety disorder diagnosis. The most common were specific phobias, which represented 50%, of, sorry, 30% of the sample, OCD and social anxiety, which represented 17% of the sample, and generalised anxiety disorder, which represented 15% of the sample. And of course, under DSM-5, OCD is no longer um, included as an anxiety disorder. In 2017, they took a slightly different approach and they looked at um, res responses uh, from standardised anxiety questionnaires, so elevated anxiety symptoms. And again, they looked at autistic children up to 18 years and they compared them with um, typically developing children and children who were clinically referred for internalising, externalising problems or uh, neurodevelopmental problems. And they found, perhaps not unexpectedly, that anxiety symptoms were higher than in typically developing children and that the difference increased with IQ so that autistic children with higher IQ uh, had more anxiety or tended to have more anxiety. And in terms of um, clinically referred children, uh, the difference increased with age. So uh, autistic children uh, who were older were more likely to have higher anxiety than clinically referred children. So overall, the autistic group had more anxiety um, and it was increased with IQ and also with age. In terms of adults, uh, Hollux and colleagues looked at prevalence of uh, reported anxiety. Um, they included studies where clinical thresholds were re, um, reached um, and they didn't include people with an intellectual disability. And they found that the current rate of in, um, anxiety in these adults was 27% and that the lifetime rate was 42%. Overall, anxiety may present differently in autism than it does in, um, in other um, and, and other groups so may present differently to uh, those who have anxiety without autism for example and this is thought to be due to um, autistic symptomatology and anxiety related to autistic symptomatology overall too being female and higher um, autistic traits have been found to be risk factors in our Australian um, samples from the two autism CRC uh, longitudinal studies. And we'll have a little bit of a look at the data from those studies uh, later on across the lifespan. So in terms of anxiety then, what is this atypical anxiety that we see uh, reported in autistic young people? Perhaps one of the earliest studies was by Kearns and colleagues who looked at autistic children and they looked at um, how many had anxiety, how many um, had symptoms of anxiety that would um, typically be covered by anxiety screens and um, interviews. Uh, atypical symptoms that are probably related to autism and wouldn't be included and then looked at the those who had each of these uh, combinations. So 37% had no anxiety, 17% presented just with the kinds of anxiety symptoms we would see in uh, people with a similar anxiety disorder. 15% had what they called an atypical presentation related to autistic symptoms and 31% had um, a typical um, atypical com combination. So what were these that they found? They found that autistic children with an atypical presentation had anxiety related to routines, novelty and restricted interests. They had unusual specific fears. They presented with social fearfulness as opposed to um, problems with social comparison that we might see in non-autistic um, groups. And they had anxieties around compulsive or ritualistic behaviour. So one of our um, master's students uh, several years ago, uh, Andy Hallam, was interested in this atypical anxiety presentation and he looked at uh, 10 autistic 
adults who uh, crossed the threshold for anxiety on the HADS and 10 people who with a reported self-reported anxiety disorder who also uh, crossed that threshold. And he found, a, he definitely found that there were atypical presentations of anxiety. So whilst the autistic and the non-autistic group reported uh, similar kinds of typical uh, things that you'd expect to find associated with anxiety, they reported things associated more clearly with autism. So for example, they reported uh, problems with social communication, not knowing what to say or do in a particular situation um, or not reading the cues in a particular situation. Um, so uh, this produced a, a sense of anxiety. And these autistic people also reported, some of them, that this didn't occur when they were communicating with another autistic person. So it was when they were communicating with uh, non-autistic people. So this person said, I wasn't really agreeing with her opinion, her, her being a non-autistic person. And she kept saying the same thing. And I kept saying no. And I wasn't seeing the signs of her mounting irritation and anger until suddenly she, until she suddenly exploded. They also reported a lot of anxiety around sensory issues, which really haven't been in the DSM up until DSM-5, but are really found to be a significant problem for autistic people, children and adults. So this person said in crowds, it's very sensory, noise, touch, smells, everything, and visual too. There's movement everywhere. I get really overwhelmed. In terms of routines and plans, kind of related to um, the, the uh, again, the uh, second criterion for diagnosis, but also related to the executive function difficulties that we see occur more frequently in autistic people. I've never been able to put that into words. It's like my processing can't keep up with the change in plans. It's like this is going to happen at this certain point. And if suddenly that's not happening, then what do I do now? And in terms of repetitive behaviours, it's more, I can't think about anything else. Like, I got to do this. And someone is like, don't touch my face. And I'm like, I got to. Also, autistic people um, in this study reported uh, what were called shutdowns or meltdowns, which some of you may have heard of. And these are different to uh, a panic reaction, which was reported by the non-autistic group. So one person described, when I reach that kind of critical mass of stress, I don't have a panic attack. I tend to break down over a series of days or weeks. I become very e easily irritated. I become very antisocial. My daily patterns and routines tend to break down and it's fairly harmful to my work and personal life because it can last a couple of days, but it takes me a couple of months to build everything back up. And this kind of um, thing can move into autistic burnout, which we don't actually have time to talk about today. And so an actual quote from the paper itself, these other quotes were from Andy's thesis. And uh, while there are quotes in the paper there, um, I thought I'd use some from the thesis that uh, were different because everyone can go and read the paper. This person talk, talks about what the shutdown does. The shutdown stops further input into the brain so that the brain has time to sort the knot that has happened and start processing again. It's like it jams up. It's like the shutdown is a meltdown aversion trying to protect itself. But if I keep getting pushed through a shutdown, I will often melt down. And in a meltdown, um, in a child, it might look like a, a temper tantrum, but it isn't. It's just this overwhelming inability to cope emotionally. And the person um, can become very uh, emotional, may become physical. Some people talked about um, uh, physically uh, injuring themselves. So self-injurious behavior in this sort of process. In terms of then, if we move on to depression, um, and again, we look at the LAY study and these uh, DSM uh, ICD diagnosis from 1993 to 2019, 11% of um, autistic children and adults um, had a current diagnosis of, uh, depress of depression or a depressive disorder. The current prevalence um, across the lifespan was 
also reported by Hudson and colleagues who used slightly different um, criteria and um, looked at chart reviews up and, <coughs> excuse me, diagnoses up to November 2016. I'm sorry, I'm, <coughs> I'm sorry about that. And they found a 13.7% um, rate of current prevalence across the lifespan. Hudson also looked at uh, prevalence in children up to the age of 18 and adults um, 18 years plus. And of course, Hollux also looked at um, look, looked at uh, adults over 18 without intellectual disability in that particular study. So we have 10.6% uh, for children, 19.4% for uh, or 23% in the Hollux study for adults. So quite high rates of depression. Hudson also looked at the life, lifetime prevalence across the lifespan and reported that at just over 14%. Um, and then dividing that into children and um, adults, he reported 7.7% for children and 37% for adults. And uh, sorry, 40% for adults. And Hollux reported 37% for adults without an intellectual disability. So what we can see here is that depression is um, less common in childhood than it is in adulthood, which is somewhat different to anxiety, which seems to be fairly common um, across the lifespan. Uh, one thing these studies uh, found was um, that depression increases with age, which fits in with that, those data that we just saw. Uh, Hudson reported the lifetime uh, prevalence of depression was associated with higher IQ. Uh, Lay and um, our Autism CRC study, Mirko Ularovich read this, led this particular paper, was associated with being female, so females were at higher risk. Um, and we also found that it was associated with autistic traits. Depression also co-occurs with anxiety, ADHD and insomnia, and we'll... Uh, talk about the insomnia in a, a little bit. So this is Australian adults who participated in the two autism CRC studies. So the, um, the um, school leavers study, which was mentioned earlier, and the adult study, which was led from the, by Professor Julian Troller from the University of New South Wales. We had a lot of um, overlap in measures in those uh, two studies. And so we combined data for um, a lot of our for a lot of our um, papers. So there are 255 people in this study and 38% of participants um, had clinical symptoms of anxiety or depression. There was no significant age group differences, but there was a trend for depression to increase into middle age, which you can see in that 40 to 64 year old um, age group. You also have to be careful in looking at the older adults because that group was very small. Uh, at this point in, in data collection, and we only had 11 people with autism, in, I think with autism, I can't remember now whether it was with autism or across the both um, samples. So you, anyway, you need to review it with caution. Um, severity of uh, autism severity on the autism quotient and being female, again, were associated in this study with uh, depression. And you can see that the rates of depression and anxiety across um, all age groups except the elderly are particularly high. Now, these two studies, I've put the data together just to um, show some differences between autism, uh, autistic and non-autistic people. And again, these are from the um, autism CRC studies. So the 15 to 25 year old data you did actually see earlier. Um, so these are people who report a diagnosis of anxiety or depression. In, and you can see that um, in terms of anxiety, there's a slight, and there's no statistical analysis here because I've just taken data from two papers. There's slightly more uh, younger people who are reporting anxiety 
um, in the autism group. And there's a lot more older people who are reporting depression in the older group. And then if you look at the control groups, you can see that anxiety is actually looks as if it's higher than depression in both younger and older people. And the rates of anxiety and depression are much lower um, in these, these Australian data than they are um, in the autism groups. So again, this is an illustration that depression, anxiety remains a problem for autistic people and across the lifespan and that depression increases um, with into um, middle age. In terms of children, this was a, an interesting study uh, by Gotham and colleagues in 2015. And they were looking at um, they were looking at autistic children versus children with a developmental delay, and they did some growth modeling over several years. So the children were first um, the children were first looked at at around six or seven years of age. And the last assessment was um, around 11 to 25 years of age. So six to seven to 20 years of age were the first data points. It was a community sample and they used um, moderate to severe um, classification on behaviour checklists such as the CBCL and the DBC. And and what you can, what they found was that anxiety and depression were high in, in boys, but from 13 to 21 years, there was an increase in anxiety and depression in girls, so that both girls and boys had similar rates of anxiety and depression at age 21. They found that anxiety was 1.4 times higher and depression 1.6 times higher than in the other neurodevelopmental disorders that they compared these um, autistic children to. And this this um, study covered a range of um, IQs from children with profound um, intellectual disability through to children who were gifted. And there were 165 autistic children in the study. So we need to, that, that concluded that we need to be very aware to screen for anxiety and depression in autistic children and adolescents. And we need to be aware that um, school age autistic boys are likely to have higher levels of anxiety and depression uh, depressive symptoms so it's maybe a greater problem for them than it is for the girls but as we progress into adolescence of course um, the girls become uh, as likely to have mental health problems as the boys do. So this leads us on to the thinking about suicide and uh, suicide is very common in autistic um, people and depression is a predictive factor for suicidal, suicidal ideation. When I say very common, I mean relative to the general population. So up to 66% of autistic individuals report suicidal ideation and attempts are reported in up to 35%. Uh, the mortality rate is higher than the general population and about 36% of Australian autistic adults and from memory, I think this was largely included the Autism CRC group, um, reported suicidal ideation at least sometimes. Factors associated with suicidal ideation or behaviours in autism that have been reported in one or more studies are mental, having a mental health diagnosis, psychotic symptoms, family history, behaviour problems, disturbed sleep, post-traumatic stress disorder, a history, loneliness, reduced social supports and increased autistic symptomatology. So now I'd like to move on to sleep problems and then talk about how these, how sleep problems, anxiety and depression are interrelated. So a large percentage of autistic children, uh, we've already seen adolescents and adults report poor sleep. It's a lifespan problem. Most often it's symptoms of insomnia that are being reported. So problems with getting to sleep, uh, poor sleep efficiency. So that's um, the amount of time you spend in a sleep relative to the amount of time you're in bed. So if you were in bed for 10 hours and you slept for eight and a half hours, you'd have an 85% sleep efficiency. And 85% and above is considered okay. Uh, increased night waking and uh, sleeping less, short night sleep. Sleep problems in autism start very young. So this was a prospective study by Humphreys and colleagues in 2014, and they reported on total night sleep, 
um, in children from six months up to almost 12 years of age. And as if you look at the graph, you can see that somewhere between 18 and 30 months of age, we're starting to see differences in total night sleep between the autistic and the non-autistic group. So somewhere between 18 and 30 months, uh, sleep is, is starting to differ. Similarly with uh, night waking, we can see that whilst uh, only a small percentage of children in both groups have night waking problems, night waking drops off in the uh, non-autistic group uh, going up to the age of about um, nearly 10 years and it remains relatively high in comparison in the non-autistic group. Again, with the changes um, starting to occur somewhere between 18 and 30 months, so they're not really there at 18 months, they are there at 30 months. In terms of autistic adults, these are Australian autistic adults from the um, Autism CRC studies. And this is looking at the report of their sleep quality on the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. And I've drawn a green line there. Scores five and above represent poor sleep quality. So we can see, as we saw earlier, that adolescents have poor sleep quality, whether they're autistic or not. But then when we start to move into the adults, young adults and middle-aged adults have significantly more poor sleep quality than do non-autistic people. Uh, again, the older age group, there was more people this time in this group, but it's still a, a relatively smaller group. So we're not quite sure whether there is an improvement in older age or whether it's just a re related to our small sample size. And again, the group that's most affected are the 40 to 59 year olds. And if you remember, those who are over 40 um, were the ones who looked like they were more affected by depression as well. We can also get objective measures of sleep using actigraphy, which is a wrist, a little, little instrument you wear on your wrist, and it measures body movements and an algorithm um, calculates uh, sleep parameters from that. So looking at autistic adults um, with an IQ uh, below 70, that is with an intellectual disability, this is a Spanish uh, study from Pura Ballester's uh, PhD. And you can see, if you look there, that um, sleep onset latency or time taken to get to sleep is much higher in the autistic adults, <coughs> excuse me, with an, uh, an intellectual disability. Um, the control group did not have an intellectual disability, I need to point out here. They were also waking more at night and they had poor sleep, poor sleep efficiency. So they were uh, spending less time um, asleep out of the time they're in bed. This is autistic adults um, who do not have an intellectual disability. Um, they have a, all have an IQ of 85 or above and so do the non-autistic um, control group. And whilst the sleep efficiency is okay in these autistic adults, it's still actually significantly less than the non-autistic adults. Um, they're taking, again, they have quite good um, sleep onset latency, but it's still taking significantly longer to go to sleep than do non-autistic adults. And they have a higher fragmentation index indicating more restless sleep. And finally, we've mainly been talking about insomnia, but Autistic um, adults also report uh, circadian sleep-wake disorders. So well over, I think it was 44%, it's hard to tell from that graph, but I think it wasn't 45, it was 44% um, met criteria for a circadian sleep-wake rhythm disorder. And mostly that was a delayed sleep-wake rhythm. So they're going to sleep um, in the early hours of the morning, one, two, maybe three in the morning. And of course that makes it difficult for them to wake up get to university, get to work, uh, or, or so on. A small number, um, and the difference wasn't significant, but more uh, reported an advanced um, sleep weight rhythm, and so that's going to sleep much earlier than they would like to go. And uh, two people, and I believe they both had mental health conditions from memory, reported a non-24-hour rhythm or a, an irregular rhythm. But overall, circadian sleep problems um, are also uh, common in autistic adults, but are less likely to be reported in children. Uh, circadian sleep-wake rhythm disorders tend to start to increase in the general population during adolescence. In terms of correlates of poor sleep, it's associated with 
um, mental and physical health. So it's associated with inattention, hyperactivity, increased arousal and anxiety, depression, behavior problems, fatigue, daytime fatigue, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, and they're very common in autism. Um, epilepsy, which is more common in autism than in non-autistic groups, and changes to the sleep EEG in studies that have um, looked at those. It's also uh, associated with uh, specific autism traits and social and cognitive factors. So you can see a range there. And particular sensory sensitivities is shown to be um, uh, significantly related with uh, autism and sleep problems. So why be worried about this? Well, there's a, in the typical literature or the non-autistic literature, there's a reciprocal relationships have been reported between insomnia, anxiety and depression for some time. So this is kind of summarizing a review by Alvero and colleagues in 2013. More recently, Her Hertenstein and colleagues conducted a, um, a, a review and they looked at um, uh, they looked at predictors of um, sorry whether or not insomnia was a predictor of psychopathology and they found that in general insomnia was a predictor of psychopathology and that it significantly predicted anxiety depression and also alcohol abuse uh, alcohol abuse and psychosis so we've got these um, significant relationships between anxiety and depression sometimes it's hard to tell which comes first and insomnia or sleep problems are also um, are also uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression in, in uh, disorders in the dsm this was a study where we looked at kids aged two to eight years from the rain database so there was 15 or 1600 children here and we looked at um, predicting sleep from two to eight years and we found that anxiety and sleep predicted sleep at eight years so concurrent anxiety predicts um, concurrent sleep problems and sleep problems earlier on also um, predict we also looked at predicting anxiety from two to eight years now we had autistic traits at two years um, from the CBCL, but we didn't have any measure of autism at age eight years. So the autistic traits didn't go into the predictive model, didn't, um, weren't significant, sorry, in the predictive model uh, for um, sleep, but they were for anxiety. In fact, autistic traits were a stronger uh, predictor of anxiety at eight years than was anxiety at two years. The other thing we found there was that sleep autistic traits and anxiety are related at two years so again these are sort of suggesting uh strong interrelationships between mental health problems and sleep problems so to summarize mental health conditions are common in autism all mental health conditions are common in autism according to the lay study anxiety and insomnia are, are lifespan problems <clears throat> depression increases with age and may be most problematic in middle age Sleep problems may be most problematic in middle age. Anxiety, depression and poor sleep may be associated with being female, autistic traits, IQ and with each other. So in terms of intervention, sad to say, there's not a lot of work. <clears throat> Therapies that are in other populations um, can be useful. CBT, mindfulness and acceptance and commitment therapy have um, all had some reports in the literature. The most, most research addresses CBT for anxiety in children and adolescents. CBT interventions generally show more to, small to medium effect sizes for treating affective disorders, according to uh, this Western review in 2016. So here's a study that was published quite recently by Sebastian Gage and colleagues, and it was an online study of CBT and mindfulness for autistic adults. There were 54 adults who were randomised to one of two self-help programs and there was a waitlist control group. So Be Mindful was obviously the mindfulness program and 14 people um, completed it. Um, and Serenity was the CBT program and um, nine people completed that and there was 16 in the weightless control. Overall, there was a 66% complete completion rate for the studies. 
Dropouts had lower verbal IQ and more uh, social communication difficulties. They found that there was reliable and clinic clinically significant change um, for, for both uh, interventions, especially at three months, with a 75% reduction in anxiety at three months. But at six months, there was no difference from the waitlist control. Um, so the waitlist control over that six months period, whatever they were doing, also um, showed improvements. However, they did conclude, sorry, they did conclude that um, CBT and mindfulness that, uh, in an online form may be useful uh, for um, some autistic adults. In terms of children, Walters and colleagues conducted a review about the kinds of modifications you might need to use for treating anxiety in children. Longer sessions to aid their learning, use of metaphor for guided discovery. So for example, using the idea of the child as a scientist investigating the issue, using acronyms for problem solving and cognitive structuring. So one that in particular I mentioned was the STAR acronym, Stop, Think, Act, Reflect. Uh, using idiosyncratic rating scales that can measure, that provide a concrete measure of change. So things like a fear, th fear thermometer with pictures that they can move up and down. Uh, relaxation strategies as a, a concrete support for affect ma management. Tangible reinforcers such as the token economies that can be used outside of therapy. Video modeling, role play and social stories. Using games in younger children to teach concepts and maintain the children's interest. Involving parents and linking with schools to promote generalisation. So basically, if you're using these kinds of interventions, if you look at the adult literature as well, um, they're making um, adjustments to take into account uh, the particular uh, issues that may be associated with their autistic clients, particularly social communication issues and issues to do with presenting things that are a more concrete um, way to help um, get, get ideas across. This is um, a, another study from 2020 looking at modifications for CBT in terms of both the client um, setting and the, um, the person concerned. Um, so what they did was they looked at um, they they looked at uh, referral. Um, the, these are the it was a Delphi study, and these are the um, things that one hundred percent of the people agreed on. Um, they they had just over two hundred different statements, and there was good agreement on one hundred and fifty five of them. But these ones there was very good agreement on. So on referral, you need um, information on core autism features and impact on daily functioning. You need to um, look at the person's suitability for CBT, so their client's understanding of social rules, the social rules of appointment, for example. You need to do things to enhance engagement, just as we saw with the children. So one of the things that uh, comes up in the literature is the suitability of the um, clinic space. So whether or not there's uh, um, the lights are okay, the noise level and so on, taking into account sensory issues. You need to have language and terminology that's appropriate to your client's comprehension. You may need to use a range of different methods to facilitate communication so understanding your individual client. You need to reduce the impact of potential misinterpretations and you need to have an open discussion about the meaning and impact of autism for the client. Um, so you know, also need to accommodate the client's potential communication difficulties or social skills impairment. So again, this enhancing engagement is all about understanding the, the client and the autism, how, what autism brings and how you might need to modify things so that you, you get good engagement with the client. Um, you need to explicitly identify ways of helping the client generalise information to wider context. So again, we saw that for the children. You may have to develop idiosyncratic and personalised scales to measure change, the fear thermometer we saw earlier. And the therapist really did, does need to be knowledgeable about autism. Um, 
So to conclude, um, Spain and Happy said, um, came to the conclusion that in terms of the effectiveness of CBT, the hows, the whys and the whom uh, still need to be determined. So how is it effective? Why is it effective? And for which people, uh, autistic people, is it likely to be most effective? Which adaptations are most effective? Um, which are the, of the core aspects of the CBT intervention are most useful for autistic clients? The other thing that's been used uh, in the literature is acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, it's been used in adolescents uh, in this particular study, finished study, addressing difficult thoughts, emotions and body sensations in students. Um, yeah. They found improvements in self and teacher reported stress, hyperactivity and emotional symptoms that women maintained at their follow up. And they also looked at five um, or 10 people with psychiatric who were psychiatric outpatients. And they examined effects on stress, quality of life, anxiety, depression, psychological inflexibility and cognitive fusion. And they found improvements post-intervention and also at their follow-up. In particular, I noted that depression improved it by the three-month follow-up. We've been doing some work on acceptance and commitment therapy for insomnia. This is our pilot study and we're just trying to start um, a larger data collection. We've had trouble getting it funded. We found that uh, the insom insomnia severity index shows statistical and clinical, um, clinically significant improvement, both at post-intervention and follow-up. But we also found that the group improved on their anxiety symptomatology. They felt the people liked it. So there's three comments that we got in uh, written feedback. And so we concluded that it may be a useful treatment for insomnia symptoms and may also lead to improvements in anxiety. So that's another thing to consider. Behavioural interventions have been used for poor sleep. They're very effective for autistic children. There's considerable literature on them. They have been used for autistic adolescents as well. This is an American study from, um, from uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, they used actigraphy as well as sleep scales to measure change. They found improvement by parent and child report, but even though sleep onset latency, that's time taken to get to sleep and sleep efficiency improved on the actigraphy, the average level time taken to go to sleep and the sleep efficiency, um, even though the improvement was significant, was still less than ideal. They also found improvements in behaviour, daytime behaviour, impulsivity and inter inter attention, and by parent report on mental health and behaviour. So moving forward, what do we need to do? Well, Mental health, I hope I've at least briefly demonstrated that mental health and poor sleep are common and interrelated in autistic individuals. And these are lifespan issues. <clears throat> There's some reasonable treatment support for CBT for anxiety and behavioural interventions for children, uh, children's sleep. There's some evidence for the effectiveness of CBT mindfulness and ACT for a range of mental health difficulties and poor sleep. In non-autistic people, why should we think about this? In non-autistic people with depression, treating co-occurring insomnia may lead to better outcomes. So we might need to think more about um, thinking about uh, when our clients uh, present with mental health problems and um, co-occurring sleep problems, that we need to address not just their mental health, but all their mental health, but also their sleep. There's little work on adults. Often in the main, these are small sample size studies with, um, if we go into them carefully, design issues. <clears throat> we haven't even begun to cover the idea of autistic burnout, um, which uh, comes, from the, comes from the stresses and other aspects of um, uh, camouflaging and uh, masking that uh, autistic people often have to um, have to do and is also related to poor sleep and mental health difficulties. So overall there's a need for education and for prevention and intervention research. So um, thank you very much and I'm sorry about the occasional uh, cough but I'll finish there. Thank you so much Professor Richdale for that wonderful um, and informative presentation and 
well done for getting the voice to make it to the end. Really appreciate it. It's getting a bit grumpy. I'm... <laughs> So I'll, give, I'll give you a couple of minutes to um to get the voice back before we answer a couple of questions that we do we do have some questions that were sent in earlier and also some questions from today's presentation. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Fiona Lenevu. I'm the um, director and OT at Time for a Future Centre for Child Development up in Woodend in the Macedon Ranges, where it's very chilly today. Um, I think it was about three degrees when I came to work this morning. I haven't ventured outside again. Um, as I said, I'm an OT. I'm also a parent of four adult children, two of whom have um, ASD and um, was very interested in that discussion about sleep, having attended Tweedle Centre for um, sleep disorders with one of mine when he was very young due to significant sleep issues. <laughs> um, I'm also the president of the Macedon Rangers Autism Network. So that's a, a rather large um, group, about 900 families in, in our region, um, supporting parents of children and adults. Um, of autistic adults and children. So um, I'm really pleased and honoured to be part of this presentation today and um, intrigued and um, interested in the connection between autism and mental health issues and also sleep issues because they are issues that come up again and again within my work and also within, um, within our support group. So we might just start with, with the questions that were sent in prior to the to the webinar today. Um, there are a couple that um, I think probably um, we can start with. One that is, is very relevant and that's about the isolation that comes after a diagnosis of autism. And I wondered whether you had any thoughts on that, Professor Richdale. I, I, I'm not sure what the person was, was getting at there. Um, some Many autistic adults um, from what I've read and, and from what I've um, heard, actually the diagnosis presents a sense, sense of relief because they um, explained themselves to themselves and um, they can connect with the autistic community which and find, uh, so they can find people to connect with and so that actually can potentially reduce isolation. So it depends what you mean by isolation. Um, I know it may be that some people do feel isolated, but I think some autistic people, adults in particular, when they get the diagnosis, explains it explains things that's been happening to them all their lives so they can understand themselves better and it introduces them to a community that understands them potentially. I guess I can talk about it also briefly from a from a parent point of view, where often when that diagnosis comes, that if you have families who don't have children who have a diagnosis of autism, don't have autistic children, that it can be quite isolating if you don't know other families or um, because of the circumstances that there there is an isolation. And I I would obviously recommend that. If that is the case, if it's the parents who are concerned about isolation, that finding support networks is really important and really helpful for families. And um, certainly, you know, Mental Health Foundation Australia and the peak bodies, peak autistic bodies in the certain states, in Victoria, for example, Amaze have um, lots of resources around parental support and also supports for autistic adults about finding communities in that area yeah. too, that can be and Asperger, Asperger's Victoria um, and I'm sure in other states you get similar things Asperger's Victoria have have um, groups for young people on the spectrum and uh, for adults on the spectrum and for for family members for, yes. for spouses and so on so yes you can be isolated but I think people find 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 supports and actually end up ultimately feeling in the main feeling less isolated yeah, yeah. I think that leads us lovely segue into our next question where you mentioned Asperger's Victoria and our uh, second question was around that are terms like Asperger's and ASD level one, two, three still used and are they useful? 
So it's a two-part um, question. I, I think um, I think autistic people without an intellectual disability still like still prefer to call themselves Aspies or refer to Asperger's syndrome. Um, and the t level one, two, and three are very useful because they help um, sort of summarize the person's level needs of support. And unfortunately, they're very important for your NDIS application. So if you've got level two and three, you're much more likely to get some support from them. Unfortunately, if you get level one, I think you've uh, got to work a lot harder to prove that you need them. So I guess, yes, in terms of the usefulness, um, yes, dependent on funding, sadly, is pretty much all they're useful for. And I, from a clinician point of view, I find the useful not necessarily useful and hopefully the clinician that is working with whoever is really just working with how the um, person yes, presents. Yes, but I, I think they provide a useful summary if someone wants to sort of generally describe what this person needs. You, mm. you, you, you've got a useful summary of the level of support yes. for, for various purposes. Sure. Um, I think another one um, that was stood out for me was that frequently people with ASD have an ID and I actually think that's changed considerably in the past 20 to 30 years the ratio in, probably in terms near, of near, diagnosis. Be near a 50 50 now it does vary a bit depending whose research paper you read yes yes so um the the question was about how do we broach the topics of mental health with those who might have a, an intellectual disability um that will very much depend on on the level of intellectual disability. I think you can probably have a conversation with someone with a mild intellectual disability, um, but I think you have to be um, very good at observing behaviour in people with more severe levels of intellectual disability and trying to work out what's going on with them. So you probably do have to take a behaviour potentially take a behaviour analysis approach, looking at what's going on in the person's environment, how they're reacting to certain things and how other people are reacting to them. Um, and as I mentioned briefly in one of the slides, people with an intellectual disability and mental health problems, it often presents with more difficult and challenging behaviours. Physical health problems do too. Um, quite often people don't realise that someone has you know, maybe a toothache, an earache um, or, uh, or something like that and their behaviours suddenly becomes very difficult and it's just treated because behaviours are communication and um, it's a form of communication for people with an intellectual, more severe levels of intellectual disability. It may be their major form of communication. So I think you have to be attuned to that and then and work out ways to work through that. Fabulous. Um, got another one on um, parents, again, becoming more comfortable um, with their own mental health and stress. Yes, parents with uh, of um, autistic children um, do tend to have higher levels of mental health problems and obviously uh, greater met, um, levels of stress. And it does often tend to be higher than you see in parents with um, other developmental um, and health, health problems. And I think that people need to be um, aware of that. And they, they need to be aware of that, I think, when designing um, treatments thinking about the parent and, and, and the family as a whole and what that family may be able to do. And it may be better initially to start supporting the parent and, and dealing uh, before you start then working with the child. So you have to, you really have to think about with children and families, you really have to think about the whole family unit. Absolutely. And certainly reminding parents too about looking after their own mental health. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yes. Having their own supports in that area. So, for example, those behavioural interventions that I said were good for children's sleep. And um, I guess the parent group in non-autistic group that would think most about this, if you think about an infant who's, who's got a sleep problem and someone tells you how to intervene with it, but you're so tired yourself, you can't do it. Well, the parent of an autistic child is going, may, may be, so, be very tired and stressed and, and it actually may not be possible for them to actually implement that. You might have to do something else in the short term before you can move to the longer term solution. <laughs> 
Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we'll just try and quickly go through because we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, diagnosis in the teenage years or adults. This has become a, a big issue, especially around. It, it has. <laughs> and uh, we have a PhD student working on that at the moment, who was uh, Robin, who was uh, a clinical psychologist for many, many years and, and realised that uh, she and her colleagues didn't know terribly much about diagnosing in adults and that were more and more people were um, turning up with di uh, for diagnosis. And I think I think what we're finding is that they've often been diagnosed with a mental health problem or they come with a mental health problem. And it can be difficult if you're not experienced. There are fewer, I think, fewer clinicians who are experienced working with adults not picking up the signs that autism might be there. Now, the mental health problem still needs to be treated, but the autism needs to be diagnosed as well. And the and that will very potentially impact how you design the treatment for the mental health problem. Yeah. And as it, yes, often also, you know, if you're seeking out that diagnosis in those teenage years or ad adults, again, using those um, resources, the peak bodies to absolutely. find those clinicians. And, absolutely. And I think, yeah. I think there's an autism team at Origin Youth Health, for example, in Victoria, um, and they, they deal with um, adolescents and, and young adults, for example. Yeah. Um, but particularly with older adults, it's difficult. Yep. We'll have to just do a couple more questions. I'm not sure how far we're allowed to go over. Um, we do have a question from an OT. We've got a couple of OTs today. Go us. Um, <laughs> someone working in an inpatient setting and just question about your experience of adults presenting with ASD and comorbid borderline personality disorder. It doesn't, it, in our research studies, it hasn't um We've had a handful of adults who've reported a, a, a co-diagnosis, uh, but it's not an area that I'm au okay with, and I don't think um, that I, I don't think a huge percentage of autistic people um, present with borderline personality disorder. But as we saw from the general research um, that I presented, there is an increased risk for uh, any sort of uh, a psychiatric diagnosis for people who um, are autistic. I would imagine that just like you do for any other sort of intervention, you need to take into account the autism in terms of, so the social communication, the sensory issues, uh, maybe the, the executive function problems that might vary with individual clients, but come with the autism in terms of um, adapting your treatments for the person with borderline personality disorder. And anything on the use of the DBT, so dialectical behaviour therapy? No, I haven't seen anything. I mean, I go through, and, and I'm an ed and developmental psych, so not a clinical psych, and uh, I, I, I'm, I said I was working on acceptance and commitment therapy, but I'm working with people in our clinic who are experts in that area. Um, but I've not seen any literature on dialectical behaviour therapy and autism. I, the ones I've put up are the ones I've seen. So CBT, ACT, uh, and mindfulness and behavioural interventions. It's really very, very limited. And there is another OT question, um, and I haven't seen any, but any any other research on the OT interventions in terms of sensory modulation on anxiety? Uh, we have the deputy director of our centre is... Uh, and OT, Professor <laughs> Alison Lane, and she's working on a sensory study at, at this moment. And um, we certainly tried, we tried a case study looking at um, looking at weighted blankets for sleep. And there has been some work on weighted blankets for sleep. And they certainly really didn't show any promise. But there is a strong relationship between sensory sensitivities and poor sleep in autism. So I think it's an area that we need to be having a look at, but we have to really, it, it needs a lot more investigation to work out exactly where and how we um, how we design those sorts of interventions. Yep, an area if OTs are interested, definitely an area to have a look at. <laughs> Lots of scope for lots of scope for research there. That's for certain. And I think we'll have one last question today. One last quick one. 
from Caroline, which is, um, do the symptoms of autism have to show up in childhood or can a, an individual have no symptoms in childhood but suddenly have symptoms that show up in their early adolescence? No, it's a it, it's it's a biologically based disorder. I think the um, I think the evidence is overwhelming. Um, it involves um, multiple genes. <clears throat> it uh, runs the, the risk of autism. If you've got a child with autism, the risk of another child with autism in your family is much higher than the general population risk. So um, there can be environmental issues that tip one over but they tend to be things again that might occur um so premature premature birth is 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 one of them for example but um no thank you thanks amanda appreciate it thank you well thank you Bye. so much professor rich dallin here now hello um yeah, thank you so much for your insights and for answering these questions from our audience. I'm sure everyone found it very helpful. I hope um, so. If anyone wants to um, email me, they can find me on the web and I'm, I'm happy to try and um, try and answer or, or, or send a paper or something like that if people want something. Yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. Um, so yeah, now I'd like to take a moment to thank each one of you for joining us for today's highly informative webinar on autism and mental health by Professor Richdale. And thank you so much Fiona as well for coordinating the Q&A. As part of your professional development, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you very soon. And yes, we look forward to seeing you all at our next two webinars. We have Food and Mood presented by Dr. Tatiana Rocks. Um, that is on the 26th of July at 1 p.m. And we also have a multilingual webinar presented by Dr. Gurpreet Ganda, um, who will be presenting in Punjabi. And that will be at 2 p.m. on the same day. And um, please find the link in the chat box if you'd like to register for those. And that concludes today's webinar. Thank you very much, everyone, for Thank attending. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now.